Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of How I Built It. We're back to our regularly scheduled episodes and I hope you enjoyed that mini series on how to build a business. Today I get to talk to my friend Beth Soderberg about how she learned web development. I loved this interview because I love learning and we both got to share our experiences which were about 10 years apart. Beth first gave the subject matter talk a few years ago and we're going to really dig into it now. But first, a word from our sponsors. This season of How I Built It is brought to you by two fantastic sponsors. The first is Liquid Web. If you're running a membership site, an online course, or even a real estate site on WordPress, you've likely already discovered many hosts that have optimized their platforms for a logged out experience where they cache everything. Sites on their hardware are great for your sales and landing pages, but struggle when your users start logging in. At that point, your site is as slow as if you were on $3 hosting. Liquid Web built their managed WordPress platform optimized for sites that want speed and performance, regardless of whether a customer is logged in or logged out. Trust me on this, I've tried it out and it's fast, seriously fast. Now, with their single site plan, Liquid Web is a no-brainer for anyone whose site is actually part of their business and not just a site promoting their business. Check out the rest of the features on their platform by visiting them at buildpodcast.net slash liquidweb. That's buildpodcast.net slash liquidweb. It's also brought to you by Jilt. Jilt is the easiest way to recover abandoned shopping carts on WooCommerce, Easy Digital Downloads, and Shopify. Your e-commerce clients could be leaving literally thousands of dollars on the table, and here's why. 70% of all shopping carts are abandoned prior to checkout. Yes, you heard that right. 70% of shoppers never make it to checkout. And that's why you need to introduce your clients to Jilt. Jilt uses proven recovery tactics to rescue that lost revenue. It's an easy win that lets you boost your client's revenue by as much as 15%, and it only takes 15 minutes of your time to set up. Jilt fully integrates with WooCommerce, EDD, and Shopify, and you can completely customize the recovery emails that Jilt sends to match your client's branding using its powerful drag and drop editor, or by digging into the HTML and CSS. Even better, Jilt's fair pricing means your clients pay only for the customers they actually engage, and you get to earn a cut of that through Jilt's partner program. Whether you have clients that process one sale per month or 10,000 sales per month, be the hero and help them supercharge their revenue with Jilt. Check them out at buildpodcast.net slash Jilt. That's buildpodcast.net slash J-I-L-T. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of How I Built It, the podcast that asks, how did you build that? Today, I have uh, my good friend, Beth Soderberg on the show. Beth, how are you today? I'm well. How are you, Joe? I am fantastic. It's, uh, well, as we record this, we are in the throes of fall here in the Northeast. Uh, Thanksgiving is just a week or so away. So a week exactly away. So I'm very excited. And I'm excited to have you on the show because uh, we're we're breaking from the normal format. We're not talking exactly about a product. We're talking about more of a process. Uh, and I think it's one that's very beneficial to a lot of people. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Beth Soderberg. I am an independent developer and digital strategist. I'm right outside of Washington, D.C., I work with all sorts of clients, a lot of nonprofits, a lot of agency work and small business work on building and maintaining their websites and also sort of making sure that their strategic vision of what they're doing is sustainable for them. I do a lot of work in the community. I am a co-organizer for WordPress DC, both the meetup and the WordCamp. And I also do some stuff with DC Femtech, which is a local women in tech collective. And some of some of the the topic today directly ties to 
a lot of work that I've also done with the WordPress training team. So that's one of the contributor teams for the larger WordPress project. So that's just a brief, brief little resume, but yeah. And so you are a, uh, a independent contractor. Would you say that you do more, you know, uh, in this crazy mixed up web design, web development world we have now, we have very specific uh, titles, right? I would say I'm a front end developer. What would you say you are? Would you, do you do a little bit of everything or do you have one area where you say you shine the most? I say that I'm a front end developer, but I, I also have to dabble in lots of other pieces. So I do a little bit of everything, but I am definitely a self identified front end developer. And I think that's where my strengths are. It's certainly what I enjoy to do the most. So, but I've been growing to be more and more of a, you know, full stack, as they say, developer for, for quite some time. But I, I reside mostly in the front end or try to. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and so I'm really glad you mentioned that, right? So I learned how to make websites and that's what I don't think I made it explicitly clear on the recording yet. We'll be talking about learning how to code, right? That's uh, kind of based on a WordCamp talk that you gave in 2016, right? I learned to code through WordPress and so can you, right? Correct. It was WordCamp Baltimore 2016. The video is out there if folks Uh, would like to watch it. Yes. And I will be sure to link that in the show notes. So I learned how to make websites all the way back in like 2001. And it's just that seems like eons ago on the internet. And when I learned, it was a fairly straightforward process. I downloaded a version of front page. I made a website in it. Uh, I looked at the code and to see what was happening as I made changes. And then eventually I moved from using front page to just using Notepad or Notepad++ or something like that. You learned more recently than me. Is that correct? Correct. I would cool. say that it... I started learning in 2010, and then I really okay. got and serious so the, probably 2011, 2012. Gotcha. And and so the process was already pretty well changing by that point. So uh, where, if if I were to learn web design today, or how to make websites today, where should I start? I have always thought, and I think it's actually a little harder starting now in 2017, almost 2018, than it was starting in 2010, 2012, because we've got even more complexity, which is, I think, you know, what you were alluding to a little bit in the difference between when you started and when I started. I still think, though, that you need to start in the beginning. Every web framework, regardless of what you eventually specialize in, whether it's WordPress or Python or something else, everything that you could possibly want to do is still based in HTML. Styling is still based in CSS, or should be, in my opinion. (laughs) And so starting with those base elements, and I'm assuming that, you know, This is assuming that we're talking about somebody who knows absolutely nothing about web development or the internet, right? They don't know how to put together the a basic HTML page that's just static. And I still believe that those component parts, if you learn them properly, will set you up to be able to learn the more complex things. And that you really need to just start with those and make sure that those are those fundamental HTML, CSS, increasingly JavaScript, which I think makes it even harder to get started, but it is becoming much more vital to understand Mm -hmm. at a base level in order to be able to build more complex things. So I think those three things, HTML first, then CSS, then JavaScript are where people need to start, regardless of what their like eventual path or goal is in terms of platform or language. Gotcha. And and that makes a lot of sense, right? Because as you said, uh, those are the, the kind of fundamentals. 
no matter what you do, HTML is going to find its way into your web-based app. It has to. So starting there, and the really nice thing about that is you don't need to compile anything necessarily, right? You can kind of look at a website and say, oh, that looks neat. How how did they do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that a lot of people, when they're just starting out, they get fixated on the end goal of the fancy thing you could build. And really, you know, you can learn a lot from opening any website in your browser and learning how to inspect the code that you're that made that makes it. And looking at the HTML structure, noting, you know, okay, if I press this button, this class changes in the code. Maybe that's coming from JavaScript, right? And putting all those pieces together in your brain is really important to being able to do the more complex things. But people see the more complex things and they want to do that. They don't want to do the more boring work of of getting to that. I think it's just, it's not as exciting, yeah. but it's almost more important. Right, right. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, you know, saying I want to throw a hundred mile an hour fastball before learning how to play catch or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. And uh, I, I really, I really like that. And again, when I first started, it was, if I wanted to learn HTML and eventually CSS, which was like around, but not super popular, if you can believe it. And I would, so I just kind of used front page as like my guide. I would do something and I would inspect elements. Today, the landscape's a little bit different, right? So if you're learning HTML and CSS today, uh, what kind of research do you think you would do in order to kind of get up to snuff? Are there books or websites that you would recommend? If I were to start completely from scratch today, I would start, I always start with books. And this is a knowing what your learning style is part of of the answer to the question. I don't hear very well. I have a really hard time with video Mm -hmm. as a result. And so I, I just struggle to pay attention because it's harder for me to listen than it is for me to read. So I would go out and get a good book. I really like the, there's a series of books and they have a diamond on the front. Yes. Uh, John Duckett is the author, I think, of those books. Yes. <laughs> right. Like a brown cover with, yeah. <laughs> they are, yes, John Duckett's books. And I have found, I've used his JavaScript book quite a bit in learning. And I know he has, I think, I, I know he has a CSS book. I think he might have an HTML one as well. And yeah, I believe I believe they're combined into one title. Yeah, I can like they, they're on my bookshelf, but I have to do like an awkward move to look at them. Right sure, sure. Now. So I'll, I'll definitely link them in the show notes, though. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like I said, his JavaScript book is something that has helped me tremendously. And I think the key with anything is starting with where you are at. For me. I really like books. Books work for me. For other people, for people I've mentored, there's, you know, I, I've mentored somebody who absorbs through Linda cl classes. They watch Linda videos. They do all the exercises. It really works for them. That's mm -hmm. great. I think there are so many resources out there. And for the elemental, like for that, this elementary layer, I don't actually think it matters which resource you're learning from, as long as it makes sense to you. And as long as you don't stay just to that resource forever, right? These books by John Duckett, they're awesome, but I'm not suggesting that they're the end all be all of learning mm -hmm. these concepts. I think absorbing through them in the beginning is great. And then finding something else that's related and amplifies and gives you a slightly different perspective is just as important as having that first piece make sense. So for me, that... Yeah, man. Yeah. It, it, I have all sorts of books. I have a huge bookshelf of uh, all these technical books that I've been absorbing for quite some time. And when you read different things or you listen to different courses or you 
do different exercises, you're going to learn slightly different angles on the same thing from each one. So I wouldn't stay constricted to one, but I would find one thing you're comfortable with first and really absorb that before you branch out. Yeah, that's that's fantastic advice. So first of all, uh, those John Duckett books, I've used them in my in-person classes, so I can totally vouch for them. But uh, even more important is your point about knowing your learning style, right? If if you are one that learns best from books, uh, I feel like I'm very similar. I can't, mm-hmm. I'm, when I'm in front of a computer watching a video, there's just like a lot of shiny objects. So I'm easily distracted. Yeah. But with a book, I can go away from my computer and my phone and read that book. So uh, definitely knowing your learning style is best. And uh, so there are a lot of great resources that you just mentioned that I will also link in the show notes. So before I get on to the next kind of standard question I ask on the show, if let's say we have we now have the fundamentals, what is what's our next step in learning to code? And I know that this was uh, specifically a WordPress talk and we have a big WordPress audience, so uh, we can totally go through the, the next the next step based on your talk. Sure. So. I fully believe that part of the fundamentals of learning to code is getting to know the larger community. Just as you mentioned, I didn't, I did not know that I wanted to be a developer when I first encountered the WordPress community. I was lucky enough to be sent by my tiny little nonprofit employer to WordCamp Boston 2010, my supervisor had convinced them that I I was the person who maintained all of the content on the websites at the time. And my supervisor had convinced them that it this WordPress conference was not just for technical people, it was also for content people, and it would benefit them if I went. So I showed up going to the, you know, the content sessions, the user sessions, the website like maintenance sessions. And I realized that I was actually pretty good at, I knew all the things I was hearing in these sessions and I just kind of dipped my toe and went to one that was more of a developer session just on the fly. And I thought it was fascinating and interesting. And The next thing I started doing when I got home, I bought cheap hosting and I installed self-hosted WordPress on it. And I spent about a year just tinkering with it. And while I was doing that, I like slowly started going to other WordCamps. I started meeting other WordPress people. I started going to the meetup in my city. And I started to think, you know, this is kind of interesting. I'm not really sure what I want to do with it yet, but I'd like to learn more. And I guess for me, it was a slow realization that it was even something I wanted to do. I think I've, I've definitely met people who have already gone through that and have figured it out before they find the WordPress community. And for those people, I think it's great because hopefully they show up at a meetup or a WordCamp and they meet somebody who says, I'm so happy you're here. You know, here's an orientation to the landscape. Let us know if you have questions. There's lots of people here who are happy to help you. And, you know, here's some pizza. Come back. Enjoy. And, you know, the, the, Getting to know the community, even when you're a beginner, is important to having resources, real life resources, where you can ask questions. And having these little projects that I was experimenting with early on is important so that you know what the questions are. You can't expect, you know, the the phrase of build, you can't build Rome in a day, (laughs) right? You can build like a little house in Rome in Mm -hmm. a day and your house might fall down because you didn't know how to build it, but it's step one towards building Rome, right? And having people around where you can ask them questions about what you're trying to do and 
get their insights about how they've done it and have them look at your code or what you're trying to accomplish with this website you're playing with and cut out hours and hours and hours of your time that you would spend sitting by yourself angsting over what to do next. You know, those same people are going to be the same people who can give you a little bit of a roadmap of, okay, these are the next three steps, you know, or over here, you've, this is, this is not good. And this is why. So that being said, it's very vulnerable to show up and to say, hey, I'm a beginner. I know that most of you are not, or even for a lot of people, I think it's that they show up and they assume that there are no other beginners, right? That they're the only one that has ever begun and that there's definitely no other beginners in the room. And that is almost always not true. So, (laughs) but it's very vulnerable to show up and say that. And I think what people need to know is that it's, it's a, that is okay to do. I have found the WordPress community to be a safe space time and time again in many, many different venues with different groups of people. WordPress as a larger community does not tolerate its meetups, its WordCamps not being a safe space for beginners. And I think because that is such an intentional part of how the community has been fostered and has grown over time, it's a really great place for beginners to just show up and absorb everything that they can and get to know people. And I think that's the like key next step, because then you have the support to move forward technically from a social level. Yeah, man, what a, that, what a fantastic answer. And uh, not (laughs) even though I've, I've seen your talk, I, for some reason, like wasn't expecting that answer, but it's, it's absolutely the, the best, next step right you 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 know a little bit and now it's time to go out there and network and meet people right and i i always like to ask on the show you know i find i find talking it out with folks really help having that mentor you know my my friend uh in college steve mikosh was uh that mentor to me you know he introduced me to to notepad plus plus and and wordpress in general and so having somebody or a group of people that you can really go to with questions is super important. And and like you said, the WordPress community is very, very welcoming of beginners. And I I agree with you. I think that's intentional, right? Uh, I have my master's in software engineering. I've hung out with a lot of very developer-y folks. And uh, somehow they feel like once they learn something, everybody should know that. Like, I have learned it, and now everybody knows it. And that's just not the case. You know, you got to remember your first few steps. I agree. I think that's a very cognizant thought in the WordPress community. So we have our fundamental skills. We have our network of people. Uh, The title question is, how did you build it? So let's go with what should we build from here or what should we do from here? We should just start building websites. This, (laughs) This goes to the start before you're ready mindset that I've heard a lot of business people talk about. As you know, I am someone who also has entrepreneurial interests. Obviously, I'm independently employed. So there's a part of me that also listens to a lot of resources and podcasts and things from the business community. And there's this theme that comes up time and time again with them that is start before you're ready. And what they mean by that is you are not going to be a successful entrepreneur overnight. But that doesn't mean you can't start a business. That doesn't mean that you can't start the process. And everything that you're going to do is complicated and it's going to have to grow over time. So you need to build that base layer first. And when it comes to web development, what I mean by start before you're ready is building websites. And they might be really, really crappy websites and they might take forever for you to build, but (laughs) that is how you learn, learning by doing. And I started with this like website that I installed and I, it never really even had that much content on it because I was tinkering with how do I change the background? How do I make this 
piece of content go over here instead of over here. And then I graduated to building these pretty simple websites for people I knew. I was on a community board for a local like community group and they had a young professionals board and they wanted a blog. So I volunteered to build the blog and I rebuilt that blog maybe three times <laughs> because I kept getting better and I kept seeing like, oh, what I did six months ago, I can do that better now. And they didn't care. No one was paying me. I was volunteering for them and doing social media for them as well. And they didn't care if I rebuilt the blog every six months. And so I did. And I learned so much from doing that. I also built a website for my aunt. And, you know, I found people that I knew who were safe, who would understand, hey, Beth is learning this skill. It might take her, you know, 10 times longer than a professional to build this. But that's okay because she's looking at it as a learning process and we don't have anything to work with right now. So whatever she does is going to be great. And finding opportunities like that within your social network, within your family, people that are safe to have, have it be an open fact where they know, hey, I'm learning. And it's going to be a slower process than usual. One of the things that I've done recently, I occasionally will end up in a situation where I find somebody that I think has a lot of potential and I just see the stars align in terms of how I can help them. And I will if I can, because people did the same thing for me. And obviously I don't have unlimited bandwidth, but you know, there's this one young woman who someone I work with introduced me to her and said, hey, could you go to coffee with her? She wants to learn to code. She doesn't really know where to start. And so we scheduled coffee. And the day before I went to coffee, someone else sent me an email and was like, hey, do you know anybody who's trying to build their portfolio? Because I don't have any money. This is an entirely volunteer project. But I really, the website is all static and it's getting to be a mess. And I really just need something that my volunteers can manage, but there's no budget because no one is getting paid and there is no money. And so I went into coffee with that sort of in the back of my head. And I met this woman and she knew all the basics, but she hadn't learned how to apply them. And so I was like, okay, here's the deal. I know this other person who needs this website and I don't have the time to build it and I don't really have the time to teach you how to build it, but I do have the time to point you in the right direction as you're going to set you up, to answer the questions and to guide you through it at whatever pace you need. And so now we're at the point that was almost 10 months ago and the website is now done. So it's taken about 10 months to build the website. And I've spent, I don't know, maybe four hours worth of time sitting with this woman in coffee shops going through her questions. It has not been a lot of my time, but she did it and she's learned so much and she's done it correctly because she's had somebody to bounce the ideas off of. So, you know, when she's gotten really stuck, instead of being able to s just sitting there by herself and being frustrated, she'll send me an email and be like, hey, I think this is probably a little thing. What am I doing wrong? Right. And finding the, the people and places. And in this situation, I'm, you know, she and I kind of formally partnered up. Right. But there's lots of ways to get that support from people. And, to build that first website or first few websites. And I know she's building other ones. She's told me about them, but she hasn't asked me for help on the others, which is a sign of growth, right? So all of that, I think, just getting out and building something, anything, it doesn't matter what it is, 
is the next step. Man, that's, I love that. I, you know, learn by doing is something I say all the time. And you (laughs) said what is literally my sign off on this show, which is get out there and build something. So just do it, right? I mean, you know, you're not, you're not building anything that is not allowed to break, right? You can, you can build your own website, right. you know, in a safe environment. And if something breaks, that's who cares, right? You're not affecting anybody by that. So it's okay to be wrong. It's, it's uh, and so I really love that. You have the fundamentals, you have people you can bounce questions off of. Now just kind of build something. And, and I always, I always send my students to code pen, mm-hmm. right? I say here, work this pen and make changes and you see what happens in real time. And it doesn't, matter if you break it or not you have a a saved copy of the original somewhere so that's excellent excellent advice (laughs) and i can't believe i'm saying this but we are like coming up on time (laughs) so i guess i guess the next the next two questions i'll combine into one uh so as you're building something what what should be your next plans for the future right if i'm if i'm trying to follow the form the normal format of the show we've built something uh, or we are building something, what do we do next? When you're talking about something that is more ongoing, like learning to code, because learning to code doesn't end, right? I'm now seven, almost eight years in, and I have this long list of things that I think I need to learn, right? I feel like it gets longer, like the longer you've been in the game. It gets longer. Yeah. I don't know how it's ever going to get shorter, <laughs> but I think that when you're talking about, you know, I know usually on this show, you're talking about a, a product or a website or something that's more concrete. And today we're talking about a process, right? And so I think the key with the process in terms of what the next step is, is monitoring where you are and adjusting your plan and methods moving forward. Because you can start with a plan. I, I really believe that everybody should always start with a plan. And if folks want to look up at the slides for this talk or the talk itself, I go into a lot more detail about very specific technical things you should learn and very specific WordPress related things you should learn and sort of the order that I did that in. But one of the things that I think is important is to basically create your own syllabus. And sit back every once in a while. I do it about once a year where I sit back and I'm like, okay, where am I now? What do I need to learn? How should I learn that thing? What resources are out there? What books are out there? Is there a course I should take? Should I go to a conference? And stepping back and sort of taking a look at where you are, being honest with yourself about where you are. This should not be aspirational. This should be very realistically, where are you? And being patient with yourself wherever that may be, because all of this is very difficult. And you're trying to put together, you know, I think the reason you and I think that our lists are just never going to get any shorter is because there's so many little pieces that come together in terms of web development to get somebody to the point where they can do what they want to do. And because there's so many pieces and because the technology is getting more complicated in terms of the minimum level of entry to do what you need to do, it's hard to think that you could ever be done. But it is important to be patient with yourself that no matter where you are on that track, it is a process and you need to be able to step back and look at what you've done and make honest, objective assessments of where you need to go next and trust the process because your code is never going to be perfect. <laughs> you know, you're always going to want to learn more things. You're always going to think, oh, if only I had focused on, you know, this technology over this technology. But I didn't realize that, you know, I was going to end up really needing to focus on this other thing later. It's all it's all good, and that patience with yourself, with the, paired with the ability to monitor what you're doing and adjust it, 
I think that's the key for sustainable long-term learning and true growth over time. That is, I will agree 100% with that. So it's, and uh, as you were, as you were talking, I thought of, you know, the, the building Rome or the build a house analogy where when you build a house, it's basically done unless it's, you want like, I don't know, very expensive renovations to the house, right? That's not the same with your website. If you, I mean, a real world example for me is I learned Angular a couple years ago, and now it seems like React or Vue is the new thing that I should learn. I'm not kicking myself for learning Angular. I've I've acquired a new skill, mm-hmm. but more importantly, I'm I've I learned how to learn. And the app I built in Angular, I can now iterate and rebuild in Vue or React or whatever it is. You know, you can you can keep iterating uh, as you said, on the thing that you've built and, and get better. So it might seem overwhelming, right? Beth and I have very long lists of things that we want to learn, but none of them is a hard stopper from keeping us from doing the thing we want to do. And I think that's really important. You can continue to build websites and learn at the same time. And, you know, I, I, I just want to communicate that it's not, it sounds more overwhelming maybe than it, than it is. Yeah, and I think that it's important to just break it into the tiny, like, bite-sized pieces. It's, you know, like any large goal, you look at the end goal. I I think this is true, like, for people who would like to write a book, right? Okay, if you would like to write a book, books are long Mm -hmm. and scary and intimidating. But what happens if you write, like a few paragraphs a day, suddenly it's not so scary. (laughs) And I think it's breaking it down into the pieces that are not scary that make the larger goals achievable. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. That sounds like a trade secret, but I'm still going to ask. Do you have any trade secrets for us? Hmm. Well, I think this is a, this is a pretty, I don't think this is a secret, but I think it's really important. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, I rewatched the talk from this that, that, that inspired this conversation this morning. And I always am afraid to watch myself speak because I always think, oh, that must have been terrible. Right. And I'm always afraid to look at my old code because I think, oh, it must be terrible. (laughs) And, you know, and every time I do either look at my old code or look at a video of me speaking, I usually come out of it thinking, okay, there's these like few things I might change and do better next time. But I actually did okay with that. And this is what I learned from doing it. And I think it's just that that kindness and patience towards yourself that's the most important thing because I think too many people get stuck in their head and they get stuck thinking that they can't do something. And some people call it imposter syndrome, but I don't know. I think it just might be human nature <laughs> to think to think that, you know, when you're trying to do something that's hard and scary, that you're gonna set yourself up in your brain to think like, Oh, I, maybe I just can't. It's really hard. And, you know, so that's not necessarily a trade secret, but the knowing that you're not by yourself when you are sitting there and thinking that whatever you're trying to do when learning to code is difficult is, I think, the key thing. Because I've just met too many people who really think that they were the only ones who had a hard time with it. <laughs> and it's just not true. And that's like the most obvious secret I think could, that you could have, but you know, yeah, it's hard. It it bears repeating, yeah, and it bears repeating as often as possible. I tell my students to ask questions, yep. because if they have a question, there's likely somebody else in the class that has that same question, and so everything you just said absolutely rings true. And so uh, we are a little over time, but that's okay because this is jam packed with amazing information. Beth, where can people find you? You can find me at my website, bethsoderberg.com, or on Twitter at Beth Soderberg. Awesome. And I will have both of those 
as well as everything that we talked about in the show notes for season four, we'll have transcripts. So uh, you can also read back this conversation uh, because there is a lot of really great stuff that might not be represented in the links that are in the show notes. So Beth, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day and coming on the show and, and teaching us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Joe. Awesome. Thanks again so much to Beth for joining me. Education is something I'm passionate about, and I hope you found value in Beth's journey. I loved seeing her give this talk, and I loved that we got to dig in a little bit deeper here. And thanks again to our sponsors. Make sure to check out Liquid Web for managed WordPress hosting. I use them on all of my important sites. They are that good. They are at buildpodcast.net slash liquid, and they'll give you 50% off your first two months just for being a listener. If you want to save your clients or yourself money through recovering abandoned carts, check out Jilt. I've had a great experience using them so far, both recovering carts and with their support. They're incredible. Definitely check them out. They're over at buildpodcast.net slash Jilt. For all of the show notes, head over to howibuilt.it slash 74. If you like the show, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It really helps people discover us. And finally, if you want to support the show on an individual basis, check out our Patreon. It offers better rewards and great goals, and I'm really doubling down on it this year. So again, if you want to support the show directly, head over to patreon.com slash howibuiltit. You can support the show for as little as $1 a month. And until next time, get out there and build something.